My name is Carlos Almeida. I am professor of Portuguese, the director of the Luso Centro, and coordinator of the Portuguese English Community Interpreting Certificate here at Bristol. We have an exciting program for you this, this afternoon, but before we start, some acknowledgments are in order. I would like to thank some people who made this event possible. Professors Odette Amarello and Livia Nubert uh, for helping in organizing. Emily Brown at the library for hosting. Emily is actually on another Zoom <laughs> event that ends at 5.30, so she should be here uh, after that. Um, Laura Carlson at Event Scheduling, Arts and Humanities Administrative Assistants, Lisa Noel and Luz Perez. I would like to extend my gratitude to Kevin Spir uh, Spirlet at Bristol Marketing and Communications, who is here taking pictures. Uh, Keith Thibault at Bristol Television Services, who is here recording this event for us to see uh, after uh, uh, on, on YouTube. Okay. Uh, Becky uh, Ferraz and uh, her staff, um, David Vieira, here with the sound system. Uh, information Technology Services, Lourdes da Silva é o Jornal, and my friend and colleague Dr. Paula Noversa at UMass Dartmouth Center for Portuguese Studies and Culture for promoting this event. A special thanks to our guest speaker, Professor Francisco Cota Fagundes, for accepting our invitation and to all of you who took time off your busy schedule to join us. I see colleagues, uh, uh, colleagues here, students and administrators, and people, my friends from the community. I would like to recognize the support and presence of our Associate Dean of uh, um, Arts and Humanities, Dr. Avis Rupert, here present. And lastly, I would like to say that this event is sponsored with the generous financial support from the Camões Institute. Last month, on September the 30th, to be exact, the International Translation Day was celebrated worldwide. I am going to read a quote, a little passage from the American Translation Association website on the history of the celebration of that day. Quote, in 2017, the United Nations passed a resolution recognizing September the 30th as International Translation Day, paying tribute to the work of language professionals. But the International Federation of Translators had designated September 30th as International Translation Day way back in 1953. Over the years, the annual celebration has been an opportunity to spotlight the important work of translators, interpreters, and others in the language service industry who endeavor to make the world a slightly smaller place by breaking down language barriers, end quote. This brings us back to the topic of translation that our guest speaker is going to discuss with us today. And now I will and I want to introduce uh, our guest speaker. He has an extensive curriculum, but I'm going just to summarize. Okay. 
Francisco Cota Fagundes was born in Agualva Terceira, Azores, and immigrated to the United States in 1963. He spent three and a half years milking cows in the San Joaquin Valley, California. Having completed the fourth grade in his native country and never having attended a secondary school either in Portugal or the US, Francisco Fagundes attended Los Angeles Valley Junior College, 1967 to 1970, magna cum laude. The University of California, Los Angeles, where he earned a double BA, 1972, summer cum laude. An MA in Luso-Brazilian study, 1973, and a PhD in Hispanic language and literatures in 1976. Professor of Portuguese Emeritus at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, he has authored, edited, and co-edited, translated, and co-translated more than 30 books. Among them, A Poet's Way with Music, Humanism, in George Senna's Poetry, 1988. Metamorfoses do Amor, Estudos sobre a Ficção Breve de George Senna, 1991. In the beginning, there was George de Senna's Genesis, The Birth of a Writer, 1992. Desta e da Outra Margem do Atlântico, Estudos sobre Literatura Soriana e da Diáspora, 2003. And Mau Tempo no Canal, de Vitorino Nemésio, Tradução, Simbolismo, Escrita, Oralidade, Diáspora. Among the books he edited and co-edited are included six on George de Sena, one on Miguel Torga, one on Vitorino Nemésio, one on storytelling, and two on the Portuguese diaspora. He also organized two fast scripts uh, on his professors, Eduardo Mayon Dias and Claude L. Hewlett. Translator and creative writer, Francisco Fagundes has translated from English to Portuguese and from Portuguese into English. He has translated eight books about which he will be speaking. Francisco Fagundes has just finished a book on the Portuguese North American diaspora. Please help me welcome Dr. Francisco Fagundes my dissertation advisor at UMass Amherst, I should stress that, who will be speaking on, who is more apt to translate, the native of the source language and culture or the native of the target language? Some reflections. Put your hands together for Professor Fagunz. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, forgive me, I have to, uh, to be chewing uh, balas, as the Brazilians uh, say, although I hope not to explode. Um, I have a throat condition, so I need to, to be sucking these lozenges in order to be able to, to have as clear a voice as possible. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here, uh, illustrious colleagues, administrators, people who, students, uh, who took the time to come here this afternoon. I am absolutely certain that you had more important things uh, to do with your time, and therefore that you chose to share it with me is an honor. I am going to speak about my work as translator 
I hope that at the end you will still have enough patience left to stay for a while and to chat uh, informally about uh, the job, the pains, the joys of translating a book from one language, one culture to another. My title, this title, uh, is intentionally ambiguous and somewhat provocative who is indeed more inclined to translate and who is indeed better prepared to translate a literary text. The person who is a native of the source language and culture of origin or the person who is a native of the target language and culture. Notice that I did not just say source language and target language only. In both cases, I said language and culture. For the idea, assuming that anyone holds that idea, that one translates from one language to another is patently false. One translates language, but language inextricably embedded in culture. And therefore, by definition, one translates both language and culture. Ideally, therefore, a person, to answer my own question, the question of my own title, uh, a person is all the more apt to be a good translator the more he or she approximates the condition of being truly bilingual and bicultural. There are, I am sure, individuals who meet those criteria. Unfortunately, I am not one of them. And here I'm not being coy or provocative. I do mean it. I may be nearly bilingual and bicultural, but I consider myself neither bilingual nor bicultural. I am at best a person who is highly knowledgeable about two languages and two cultures. Portuguese language and culture as spoken and lived in Portugal, and English language as it is spoken in the US, and American culture. Let me further explain, and here I have to repeat some of the things that Carlos uh, just presented. I was born and lived in the Azores, Portugal, until I was two months short of 19 years old. I am 78 years old and have, since 1963, always lived in the United States. I finished elementary school in Portugal for years of basic education. Since then, I never attended a formal school in my native country. In the US, I never attended high school. Instead, I attended the junior or community college for three and a half years, where I completed the equivalent of secondary education plus the equivalent of the freshman and sophomore year of college. I then transferred to UCLA, where I earned a double BA in Spanish and Portuguese, an MA in Luso-Brazilian Studies, and a PhD in Hispanic Languages and Literatures. From 1976 to 2017, I taught Portuguese and Spanish language at UMass Amherst and Portuguese, Lusophone, African, and Brazilian literature. How do I view myself in relation to my original language and culture? And how do I view myself in relationship to the language and culture of the United States, considering especially that in the US, I only lived for three and a half years in a Portuguese community. Since 1966, I have always lived and live to this day in a non-Portuguese community. I continue to be a native speaker of Portuguese, but with all the linguistic wear and tear that is to be expected in the case of someone who has lived away from that language for 60 years. I have intellectually lived many aspects of Portuguese culture in the United States, have taught as a professor of Portuguese for 45 years, but in 
almost 60 years have not been immersed or continually breathed that culture as I would have had I stayed in Portugal. As for the English language, I began studying it informally in Portugal, but formally only studied it in the US. For the past 57 years, I have used and still use the English language every day. I do, however, speak English with an accent. I express myself as fluently in English as I do in Portuguese in matters pertaining to the world of academia, especially the humanities, which has been my professional and largely my social world since I started attending school in 1966. But I myself can identify numerous lacunae in those daily aspects of English and American culture that I never had a chance to experience. The world of kindergarten through high school graduation, the world of growing up as an American child, teenager, young adult, the world of playing and watching sports popular in America, the world of popular culture, the world of movies and popcorn, the world of dating, the world of looking for colleges with my parents and going away to college. I could go on and on. I have no recollection of the worlds and accompanying linguistic knowledge and experiences that I missed because I immigrated from the Azores to America the worlds that I missed in America because I was a young adult immigrant from the Azores who initially lived on the margins, worked 12 hours a day without any days off, and who wasn't even aware that what kind of life was going on out there outside the barn where I was milking cows. You may or may not be surprised to know that as a student at Los Angeles Valley College, what we call in a junior college, a community college, and even at UCLA, I often heard for the first time about recent popular bands when they no longer existed, about important current events that had just passed me by without my being even aware of them, about contemporary movies that everybody seemed to be talking about, but I would only see or not in the future. Are there ideal translators, people who are close and equidistant from both languages and cultures in the transaction called translation? Theoretically, perhaps. In reality, though, I doubt it very much. All translators are really self-made. Their craft is learned, even though, as in most activities in life, a certain innate predisposition or talent helps. I cannot imagine anyone performing at their best at any task that they do not feel attracted to. Like most other tasks, translating effectively is a matter of commitment, determination, hard work, a little humility, and patience, a lot of patience. If you are going to be an effective translator, you must be prepared to spend as long a time translating a novel as the author spent writing it, or even longer than the author spent writing it. Yes, the rewards of translating, monetary or academic, are not and probably will never be great, unless or until you make a good name for yourself, and even then. From the outset, however, you must be prepared to try and discover your own rewards in the very act of translating and having translated. You must also be prepared to confront this awesome truth. No matter how much time you invest translating a given work, there will always be room for improvement in that translation. Someone could always have done it better than you. And no matter how definitive you may think your translation is, there will come a time, say within 25 or 30 or 40 years, when that translation will have to be redone so that the work may 
remain viable in translation in that language. This is the reality of translation. This is the truth concerning the work of the translator. Let me now briefly speak of my work as a translator and in a little more detail about my work as translator of Vittori Nunmezio's Maltempno Canal, or as I translated Stormy Isles and Azorian Tale. Finally, I will touch upon my work as a scholar and translator and how, have, how they have largely coalesced. Finally, I will say a few words about the issue of translation theory and the role that it has played in my work as translator. I have translated eight books and a few hundred pages of excerpts from fiction, poetry, essays scattered throughout the books and essays I have published. Yet, I don't consider myself a professional translator. I don't translate books as a primary intellectual or economic activity. I translate because I like to do it. I like the act of translating. I like especially the feeling of having translated. I only translate books that I like. If I did not like a book, I would never translate it. With two exceptions, I have always chosen the books that I translated. And those exceptions include Stormy Isles. I have turned down a number of offers to translate well-known books because I did not like them or thought I could not do them justice. About half the books I have translated have been from Portuguese to English. These include the novella, The Baron, 1991, by the Portuguese modernist writer Branquinho de Fonseca, Stormy Isles and Azorian Tale by the one-time modernist and Azorian writer Vitorino Nemesio, which I'm going to privilege in this talk. I have also translated an anthology of Cape Verdean poems published in a volume by Maria Moreira. And I have co-translated two books of poetry by Jorge Sena, Metamorphoses, a work consisting of poems inspired by works of visual art, painting, sculpture, architecture, and art of music, 1998, a volume of poems that draw inspiration in part from works of art music from Baroque to classical to romantics like Berlioz and Wagner to modernists like Debussy and Schoenberg to the works of the popular singer Edith Piaf. These two volumes of poetry are the most difficult works I have ever had a hand in translating. However, I did not translate these poems by myself, nor would I have accepted to do so. I translated them with James Houlihan, a poet in his own right. From English to Portuguese, I have translated four books, one of them, immigrant, all of them immigrant autobiographies. Being an immigrant, I have always been interested in migration and have dedicated considerable time to the study and translation of works of Portuguese immigrants and American-born descendants of Portuguese. I just concluded the book on the history of Portuguese diaspora literature in North America, a brief book, 200 pages, Together with Zé Francisco Costa and Silvia Oliveira, I'm working on a pedagogical anthology of North American diaspora literature, which I hope, we hope, to have concluded in another couple of years. In the field of North American Portuguese diaspora literature, I have translated the autobiography of the pioneer from Fayal, Azores, Charles Peters, who left his island in 1834 at age 10 as a cabin boy aboard the American whaling ship out of New London, Connecticut. Charles does not dedicate much time to writing about his whaling experiences. His brief life story is about his prospecting for gold in Jackson, California, eventually discovering a gold mine, never having acquired the capital to develop that mine undergoing a series of tragedies such as the death of his wife at an early age and of his only son before he himself passed away 
at the ripe old age of 96. Charles Peters, in the last years of his life, was a colorful character about town, on special days appearing dressed as a 49er. He passed away in a storm by drowning in the creek where in his younger days he had prospected for gold. I also translated the autobiography of Lawrence Oliver, an Azorian from Pico, who immigrated when he was still very young, acquired a sixth grade education in the United States, and worked in various jobs in several areas of California. Eventually, he ended up in San Diego, where he lived the rest of his life. He worked mostly in industries ancillary to the tuna fisheries in San Diego, ending up by owning a major fish bone and bone meal plant that produced feed for animals. He not only became a millionaire, but also an important and influential person, both in the Portuguese community of San Diego and in the San Diego community at large. He was especially known in his later life as a philanthropist, having left a considerable portion of land to build a camp for children. Laurinda C. Andrade, Laurinda C. Andrade is another immigrant whose autobiography, The Open Door, or A Porta Aberta, 2017, I translated to Portuguese. Laurinda came to New England at age 17, unaccompanied by family. Arriving in 1917, she worked in the cotton mills of the city, in New Bedford. She developed tuberculosis due to the breathing of particles in the air of the plant, like hundreds of other immigrants who worked in the mills of New Bedford, Fall River, Lowell, and Lawrence. Following her dream of becoming a teacher, she eventually finished high school, went on to attend Pembroke College, Brown University, graduating in the early 1930s. She navigated the turbulent economic waters of the Great Depression and eventually managed to find a job as director of a Portuguese language newspaper in Newark, New Jersey, where she remained for a time and made a name for herself with her, for the time, liberal ideas. She was a kind of proto-feminist. A local Portuguese restaurant that had never served women except at the takeout did open its doors to her when she demanded to be served in the dining room. The rest was history. She became well known and respected in that community as a woman willing to challenge customs and traditions in the name of fairness and equality of the genders. Laurinda ended up working for the Portuguese legation in Washington, D.C., the forerunner of the Portuguese embassy. Eventually, she returned to New Bedford as she still pursued her dream of becoming a teacher. After some difficulty in convincing some administrators, including former teachers at the school, a Portuguese program was instituted at New Bedford High School. Laurinda, who would go on to earn an MA from Columbia University, eventually founded at New Bedford High School the first Portuguese language department in the country at the high school level. This is in the late 40s. She was also the first Azorian woman to publish her autobiography in 1968. Another immigrant autobiography I translated from English to Portuguese was my own. Hard Knocks, an Azorian American Odyssey, published originally in 2000, whose title in Portuguese is No Fio da Vida, uma Odisseia Sul-Americana. I am therefore a self-translator. This is not as simple as it may seem. On the one hand, one knows what one meant to say the first time. Therefore, one should have no problem translating, that is, penning the same story a second time in a different language that one knows. Sounds simple enough. But then the problems begin. It is my text. I don't have to remain faithful to it. I can change whatever I now think I could say better or differently, and so on and so forth. Does one remain faithful to the story one strove to write convincingly? 
truthfully the first time? Or does one change that story at will since it is one's own story? But isn't that a kind of betrayal of the reader of the first version with whom one established a kind of ethical contract by appealing to the trust of that initial reader? Isn't there some sort of implicit contract between a narrator and a reader of an autobiography? As the French theorist Philippe Lejeune opines, one to tell the truth and the other to trust that the first is telling the truth. Self-translation sounds a lot easier than it really is. In part, that's why when I published my second autobiography, I still have five to go because, like the cats, I have seven lives. Viagem pela escuridão, memórias de uma doença, a voyage through darkness, a memoir of, il of an illness, originally written in English, I had someone translate it. The most important reason I did not translate it, however, was that this book is about my son Evans' bout with a brain tumor and its after effects especially clinical depression. In order to translate that book, I would have to relive in my mind many of those terrible experiences undergone by our son, my wife, Maria de Olinda, and me. I decided that it would be too painful on all of us, and so I left it for someone else to translate. Besides George Sena's volumes of poetry and art of music, Stormy Isles, and his Tale was by far the most demanding work I have ever translated and am likely to ever translate. In the case of George Sena's poetry, as stated, I co-translated it with James Houlihan. Nemesio's work, on the other hand, was my own sole translation responsibility. Hence, for me, much more difficult than the poetry. What then are some of the qualities that made the original Mautemp Nukanal 1944 so challenging and difficult for me to translate? First and foremost, it is an extremely high value novel, for it is the main fictional example of Azorianity ever written. In this sense, there is a parallel between Stormy Isles and the Cape Verdean novel, Chiquinho, translated by Isabel Feu and Carlos Almeida. Both are high value works in their respective cultures. And this is by far not the only parallel between the two authors and the two novels. Azurianity is a concept that Nemesio proposed in 1925 in a brief essay. This concept was inspired by the term Hispanidad, 1908, an old and important concept that the philosopher and writer Miguel de Unamuno of the generation of 19, I'm sorry, of 1898, renewed and imbued with new vigor in the aftermath of Spain's defeat in the Spanish-American War of 1898 by the United States. Azorianity predates the movement of Claridad in Cape Verde and the launching of the review of the same name in 36. Azorianity was based on the idea that the people of the Azores had created a Portuguese-based culture that had evolved enough to become sufficiently distinct from the Portuguese mainland culture and that this culture was deserving of a literature to convey it. Nemesio was not the greatest theoretician of Azorianity, a task that would fall to others like the ethnographer Luis da Silva Ribeiro. Nemesio was, however, the greatest writer to emerge from the loosely organized group of Azorianist writers. He published regionalist short stories, poetry, novels, a travel narrative exemplifying the concept of Azorianity. His fictional work, that is his greatest bearer of Azorianity, however, is Stormy Isles, originally published in 44. 
Multiple canal or stormy isles is a novel, a novel of manners, but also a family saga and a partially historical novel. It constitutes an amalgam comprised of regional variants of the Portuguese language, Azurian history, tragedies resulting from volcanology. It's a repository of folklore, religious practices like the Holy Ghost celebrations that had practically vanished for the, from the Portuguese mainland but survived in the Azores and were transported by Azorean immigrants to Brazil and also brought to the United States by Azorians and Cape Verdeans. The use of linguistic regionalisms is one of the difficult elements of the novel to translate, as many of them are not even in the dictionary or appear in the dictionary with slightly different meanings than those intended in the novel. As we know, there are different pronunciations from island to island of the Azores, with the pronunciations of São Miguel and Terceira being the two that distinguish themselves the most from the pronunciation of the other islands and of the mainland. However, each of the islands has a slightly different pronunciation, at least of some words. Fayals being perhaps one of the pronunciations that deviates the least from the standard Portuguese that's spoken between Coimbra and Lisbon. Nemesio deploys many of these regionalisms and in an attempt to suggest distinct pronunciations from island to island, actually makes alterations on the conventional spelling of words. Another example of regionalisms in Stormy Isles are the English loanwords introduced in the Azores by the whaling industry, both pelagic and coastal. Dozens of terms associated with whaling and deployed in Stormy Isles sound almost like the original and are used with identical meanings as in the original. Blows for there she blows, spalmu for spout. Others are almost unrecognizably Latinized. Baila for bailer, lagayet, the loggerhead, and pulayet, pulayet, from the rowing chant, pull ahead, pull ahead. A few are used with semantic values differing slightly from the original meanings. Froca, from frock, but meaning men's shirt. These many words and expressions are supplemented by many other terms dealing with other types of technology and everyday language as well, brought to the Azores by immigrants who had migrated to the United States and returned to retire in the archipelago. Marqueta for market, store for store, injarrobas for Indian rubber, shut up for shut up, sanabagana, sanabagan, thank you for thank you, morning for money, hof, nossa frame, which is one of my preferred of these, non se frame for don't be afraid. A sucrim for ice cream. I have stories to tell you about a sucrim if you wish to know them. Uh, and so on and so forth. Many of these immigrants continued to use these loan words or immigres, as one of my professors called them, thus contributing to the number of regionalisms used all over the islands particularly in those where the whaling industry lingered on for decades after it had disappeared elsewhere, in the case of the island of Pico, until past the middle of the 20th century. Stormy Isles is redolent with terminology referring to archaic institutions, not only whaling, but also archaic agriculture, archaic legal systems, economic systems, social systems, architecture, religious ceremonies like the Holy Ghost celebrations. All of this is to be translated, whether this terminology is or not in the English Portuguese or Portuguese English dictionary. As examples of the many hurdles I had to overcome, here are a few. Later, I will reflect briefly on the role of translation theory or traductology in the practice of translation. As is the case of anglicisms or regionalisms, I hasten to add that there is nothing remarkable 
about these difficulties and my way of solving them. They are run-of-the-mill problems that translators encounter, and my solutions for them were equally the kinds of solutions that any translator must be prepared to apply. A challenge I faced and had to overcome was the translation of a very important page about billiards or pool. There's a slight difference between the two that ask me what the difference is because I don't know either. At the time I translated the novel, I did not know anything about billiards or pool. But for the translator, there is no excuse for not knowing the subject matter of the work he or she is translating. It has to be translated. And in order to be translated, it has to be learned. For there is another related rule equally important. The translator should never even attempt to translate what he or she cannot conceptualize and does not understand. Translating just words in the hope that correct meanings will follow somehow follow the words, never works. You will always be wrong. So what's the solution? If you don't know the subject matter, you must learn it. You must study it. And until you understand it well enough, you should not translate a word of it. To translate that page dealing with billiards, I had to read three or four books about billiards. At the end of it, I still was no expert in billiards by any stretch of the imagination, but I felt I understood it well enough and had learned its terminology sufficiently well to do justice to the page, which I then, and only then, proceeded to translate. Moving on to another challenge, what, what does one do with bullfighting terminology, which in Nemesio appears as derived from both Spanish and Portuguese? Not only be able to conceptualize key aspects of the art of bullfighting, but find the proper terminology to express it without denying the reader access to what is being discussed in the novel at the same time that the reader is not befuddled or confused by the terminology deployed. In this case, I studied and followed other American writers who had to work with this subject matter. In the case of bullfighting, I could not get a better teacher than Ernest Hemingway. He often deployed bullfighting terminology in works of his. In some examples of phrases or sentences, he used both a literal translation and the original from the source text, thus providing a literal meaning for the reader, but at the same time relying on him or her to derive the rest of the meaning of the phrase or sentence from context. This strategy also contributes to the aesthetics of the text by providing defamiliarization, a concept you may not be some of you may not be very familiar with, we can talk about it, a big aesthetic dividend without running too big a risk of alienating the reader. I quote a brief passage from my translation. The espada or swordsman, the espada or swordsman himself will work with cape and red cloak, the bulls of his choice. All police regulations will be enforced in the air, in the arena. The doors open at three and the public is welcome to attend the embulamento or patting of the bull's horns. The esteemed public is hereby notified that there are no special discount tickets available. Ole, ole, bring on the matadors. Obviously, if I were to read a lengthier passage, you would understand yeah. So, on the one hand, I am using the word embulamento, okay, which the reader does not know what it is, but then I translate it 
embolamento or patting of the bull's horns. So you get the embolamento. The embolamento is there to create that which I refer to as estrangement or defamiliarization because the concept being that we like to see in a work of art, in a literary work of art, language that is not familiar to us, language that, but at the same time, we don't want to be deprived of the meaning of the text. We have to understand the text, but you can throw at the reader something that, you know, will sort of startle him or her, and that is something that a lot of theorists agree uh, produces uh, aesthetic uh, value. Still on the subject of conveying meaning and contributing to the aesthetics of a text through defamiliarization, I again return to whaling anglicisms. How does one resolve the issue of anglicisms related to whaling? When those words derive precisely from English, by reverting them back to English and thus erasing any vestige of their etymological origin, or utilize the anglicism as deployed in the novel, but at the same time providing brief notes on the etymology of the words. I alternate between these two modes, lest I overplay one of them and bore the reader. Quoting again a very brief passage of my translation. Standing on the stern of the last boat, Juan de Cecilia gestured his arm signaling its two sperm whales and he raised his right hand in a V sign. Two big spalmus moving towards the northeast his voice, drowned out by the wind blowing toward Ponch Partel, the same direction in which the boats progressively moved, impelled by the strong oar strokes to the chant of Pulayet, Pulayet. And then a brief note saying that Pulayet, Pulayet comes from the English, pull ahead, pull ahead. But if I had just translated pull ahead, pull ahead, it would the polayet, polayet would be deleted, would be, would be lost. Of course, you can disagree with that. Yeah. But that's a decision that you, as a translator, might have decided. Otherwise, okay, no, I'm just going to translate it back to English. Okay, so you have many options as a translator. Finally, I would like to quickly address the issue of translation theory in the work of translation. Translation theory, which may may consider a branch of literature, of literary theory, and of linguistics, is the science that studies the concepts, advocates for strategies, attempts to resolve controversies, and so on, involved in the art of translating. Theory makes it possible to reflect on concepts affecting the text being translated, concepts as basic as faithfulness to the original author, naturalizing a translation, a translated text to suit the ease of the target reader or remain especially faithful to the original text or aim for something closer to equidistance from both. These and the myriad other concepts and attendant terminology can have a very practical value in translating a text for different ways of looking at the art of translation can provide the translator with options and very often what the translation needs, the translator needs the most are options, not one-sided, ideological driven solutions. Equally important is that the theory of translation can provide the translator with, very, with the very concepts and terminology that he or she can employ to reflect on his or her work of translation, for him or her to realize what he may be doing or why he may be doing what he is doing, how he or she is going to decide how and what to translate. In the rare cases, as in Stormy Isles, an author deploys multilingualism. Nemesio uses seven languages in the original version of Maltimp Nucanal, portions of text in English, French, Latin, Spanish, German, and Dutch. Many of his readers in Portugal, an elitist readership almost by definition we could discuss that, a topic I cannot do justice to here, 
uh, could probably read at least adequately enough the language as deployed. Would it be fair for me to assume, as translator of Stormy Isles, that my American readers, or English readers in general, would be able and would want to read a translated novel containing excerpts in five other languages? And if those excerpts are to be translated, which are to be translated and why? I have to make that decision. Are the solutions to be determined solely on the basis of facilitating comprehension or the translation, the translator also needs to take into account the aesthetics of the text and what the readers of the target texts are more likely to want? As one proceeds to resolve these and other similar issues of translation, one is relying on the theory of translation. In conclusion, if it were not for translation, our Western world, as all of us know, to only refer to the Western world would be radically different. Without translation, where might we be? right now. Think of the world's most influential writers and texts, which would never have been, which would never have reached most of us if it weren't for translators. Plato, Aristotle, the Bible, the Quran, for example. Numerous writers whose works have changed the world, if it were not for translation, would have remained confined to the borders of their original languages and cultures. Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Dante, Shakespeare, Camões, Machado de Assis, or writers and works that did not change the world but affected profoundly and continue to influence their small worlds, like Vitorino Mesius, Stormy Isles, and Balthazar Lopes, Shikino. Translation is necessary. Translation is hard. Translation is sharing, given of what we have, accepting that which we lack, even if it reaches us in less than perfect packages. Translating is engaging in a basic human transaction. Translation is also creation. Translation is pain, but also a lot of fun. Thank you. If you still have any patience and want to make comments on my text or ask any questions that I, that I may be able to answer, if I am not able to answer, I will, I will say again. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's all 
to be honest with you, I don't feel comfortable translating the rule. I did uh, wrote my own autobiography. Yeah. I, I had a 70 uh, rule page yeah. to translate. Yeah. And I translated it to English, but then of course I had to reread. Yes. And yes. all the corrections. Fine. So it long, a lot yes. Easier. Sure, sure. So long as what then you put out as yours has been, you know, has been gone over by you. And you have been printed your personality, if that is the proper terminology. Right. Uh, you know, you know what I mean. But yeah. you, you don't want to depersonalize yourself to the point where you let a machine, mm -hmm. because you can read it, you know, yeah, sure, you know, it, it sounds fairly close to what I, I meant <laughs> to say, but is it the way I would have said it? Probably not. Would you say that you must like a conductor? Great music. Yeah. And yes. Well, I think it's a very good analogy. Someone else is. Yes. A very good analogy. Creativity. In your yes. Life. Yes. I yes. mean, uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, maestros, you know, could uh, could play, you know, an orchestra play. I don't know, Moldau or something like that. But you hear differently if you're not, even if you are a trained musician, you know that. That is not exactly the way that the other guy went. So, yeah, that, that is a very good analogy. But if I were, if I were a technical musician, I, I would be able to explain it more clearly. You know, I like that. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Musician, yes, conductor, yes, reading the music. Right. Okay. Yeah. The, the, uh, the experience that I have. It's going to get to the point where 
it's going to be so good, so good, so good, that you don't want to touch it. But we are not there yet. I'm sorry. I just had a specific question about poetry. So your colleague and you were together. Was your colleague also bilingual? Or did you kind of translate the poem and then he... Yeah. Like, I, I presume poetry. that you are uh, you are referring to James Willoughby. Yeah, okay. okay, let me tell you how, how it happens. Uh, I had written a book on short cinema. Uh, I would go on to write a couple of books on him. And I had used a lot of translations, I mean a lot of uh, quotations from this book. And then uh, I was told by the, by the publisher that I couldn't just leave that in Portuguese uh, and to translate. So I made an attempt to translate as closely as possible. But, uh, to begin with, with the language of music. Music is, as we all know, the most technical of all, of all technical uh, of all the arts. So you have the music, and then you have, of course, the poetry, as the Shaykh has just mentioned, you know, where poetry tries to reach with, with, with no other genre dares, dares to try. Uh, so uh, I knew that it was not enough. So what James Houlihan, who did not know poetry, tried to do with me, and did with me, for better or for worse, uh, was he tried to, to poeticize what I had done. Okay? And, we, and we often discussed what the original meaning was and so on. And of course, we allowed also our sensibility, uh, his as a poet, mine as a person who was very much interested in you know, this, you know, taught literature, who loves poetry, even though I don't like poetry, uh, we try to blame as much as possible our sensibilities, yeah. if that makes any sense. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we came up with. Okay? But when it came to deciding, okay, this is poetic, we are doing justice to George Sinner, the poet, and your suggestion is not is not so. I would always go with this. Okay, because I knew that, uh, that the, as a poet, you know, I had no business question. I'm so glad you, you, you did the translation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's been a long time, decades, since I read the original. I remember it being like the subjective and the objective being a false dichotomy. You know, there's a feel of agua, and it was just like the clarity in, of reality, and at the same time, you know, subjective, you know, perception of the, the objective. Um, but I'm thinking um, the particular and the universal, not unrelated to that differentiation, choosing to you know, bring something new that's not known, and at the same time you're translating, which by definition in Watch Pop works with what's known to bridge the, to that yes. unknown, and the choice is involved in those that thing. But also the uh, particular in, in the universal. You know, we're all mortal. We all have limited experiences. We can only live our own lives in a fundamental sense, and yet we're all human, and that you know. We do, and the idea that we're individuals and can never be someone else is part of a common human uh, condition. Yeah. And I'm thinking, um, why would you want to translate it? I can think of, like I said, I'm so happy you did. But what were, what are you trying? What were you trying to? Why did you make the decision to translate? What did you want to bring to us or to the reader that they wouldn't have had otherwise? Yes. That something that you know that you appreciated and thought was valuable. Even for someone who's not Portuguese, you know, even a, uh, an English reader who might not be even American or, a, you know, because English is read by many more, you know, people from various parts of the world, even as a second language. What, what was, um, what was the p peculiarities of the, this work? The actual, the people, I'm thinking that guy who comes back, he's been wailing in different parts of the world. Yeah. He's relating his stories. And I felt like, I, it, 
reminded me of times where I've listened to people who had a much more, much different life from my own, and then all of a sudden been captivated in their own experiences. And, and, it, and I was able to appreciate that it's not my experiences, and yet incredibly appreciation of their having shared it with me, mm -hmm. and it, you know, touching me in a very fundamental way. Yeah. So, um, you know, the peculiarities of the story, yes. and how that's not unrelated to yeah. a common humanity that you felt was um, worthy of conveying to people. What would resonate to someone who's not from those? And, you know, like introducing them to these characters, it opens a world to them that has meaning beyond those particular characters. Wow. Uh, we all could write a book <laughs> and attempt to uh, to answer your question, uh, you know, it's, it's an infinite question almost. But I will give you two answers to it. First of all, uh, I will give you an answer that comes from the immigrant. Okay? Uh, being an immigrant is living on the margins for a long, long time, sometimes forever. Uh, the fact that I have a PhD, the fact that I became a full professor, the fact that I have a middle class life does not mean that they have not. Marginal, not necessarily living in the marshes because anyone out there comes and marginalized that marginalizes me. I am living on the margins because I am not complete. I am a split person in this, in this culture. Half of me belongs on one side of the Atlantic, the other half belongs on the other side. And if anyone tells you that you can bring yourself whole, okay, in, 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 into a society uh, with a different cultural background, linguistic background, and you can transport yourself whole, and then and then sort of dislodge yourself from that and, and convey yourself to the other culture. But maybe there are people who can do it. I cannot. So, since 1963, when I left my, my country of birth. And this has absolutely nothing to do with which country is superior, which country is inferior. It's nothing to do with that. It has to do with me. Okay? I, I don't feel 100% in this country, despite the fact that it has given me most of the things that I have uh, So it was an attempt on my part, this is the immigrant speaking, to bring something of my culture on the one hand and say, gee, you know, we also wrote novels. And uh, yes, you know, I, I read your Steinbeck, and I read your, 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 uh, your Hemingway, and I read your Faulkner, and so on. Yeah, and he is a guy who just is, just as good, you know. Uh, he may not have written, you know, in the most uh, widely circulated language, but you know, maybe by translating him, I can bring a little bit of our stuff also. So there was a little bit of that, okay. Uh, as far as bringing to my readers, this is now the scholar, the translator speaking, bringing a little bit of ourselves to share with Americans. I have discovered in my 78 years, uh, Kevin, and I'm sure I find people here who share the same feeling with me. The more I read, the more I study, the more I experience, the more I realize that we are all the same. And the fact that we were born in Portugal, and that we were born in the United States, and that we were born in Poland, or in Israel, makes really relatively little difference. Because where it really hurts us, and where joy resides, we are all human. Okay? So, is there anything in multi now that Americans would be absolutely dazzled to discover they would never have discovered if they Of course not. Of course not. And I can say the same thing about Hemingway, I can say the same thing about Faulkner. Uh, but it is culture, Western culture, as we experienced it. Okay? And it is also a great feeling of joy to be able to share something that was born in your culture and you bring it over here. So this idea of sharing, okay, this idea, well, uh, we are not all that deprived. We also have writers and so on. Okay, and that's there. And then there is a little bit of, well, 
this is how we experience these things. Okay? They are not novelties, but they have enough that is perhaps different, okay, that might you have you enjoy it uh, or, or learn something from it. Okay? But I think the element of sharing, I think the element of sharing uh, cultural experiences because uh, we all experience these basic feelings and it's therefore not the fact that we that we experience different things is that we experience things in slightly different modified ways you know, about so about talk about any even if it's something relatively simple like that okay everybody experiences experiences uh, home uh, Home sickness. I think it's a gorgeous word. Okay, home sickness. Heimweh uh, in German. I'm studying German. Okay, these are beautiful words. You see, the thing is that Soldat is so loaded for us. Not only because we give it so much attention, because we invested so much of ourselves in it, but because it makes sense in the case of a people who, since the 18th century, actually much before, you know, since the 15th century, we've been going all over the place. Okay, so so that has a meaning to us that is so loaded, so loaded, so loaded, that is not the same as nostalgia or yearning and so on in other languages. Okay, because in America, people never immigrated as we did, we Portuguese. Okay, and therefore, uh, homesickness to them never has that Wrenching meaning that that, that Salat has that it has for us. So even if it is just something relatively small like this, you know, if you take a 400, 500 page novel, there is an awful lot in there that you want that you that you, you would want to, to know, that you would want to read, and so on. And, and it's it's a bridge, you know. As someone just said, it's a bridge that we. I don't know if I answered your question. I'm not really trying to satisfy the message that I provided that I gave I wanted to say thank you so very much. When you discuss the trail within and the now, I will have to think about that. That is wonderful. Second, in about 10 months, mm -hmm. I will finish my fifth degree. When I finish that, I'm going to revise a book that I've written. I've already identified who I wanted to translate. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about biculturalism within the context of what I've written, I yes. did not think about it. And it is so powerful to convey the essence of what I'm saying. And you mentioned the word soul. I needed to hear that. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Yeah. Someone did before me. <laughs> I, 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 I translate from music. Okay. And yeah. that's how I, you, you paint a picture, but I translate it as a musical. Uh -huh. Because it, it's art you're doing. Yeah. From your eyes, your, your reality is different from mine yes. and yours. And we yes. also can we do that in musical literature? We have a group of students here. We would like to hear a comment or question from the students. Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah. You can and you must criticize your professors if it comes from, not for the sake of just criticizing, but you know, I disagree with you. Yeah, please do. I just wanted to, um, as you were talking about Sojab, it's, it's, I really resonated with that because I tried to explain to my friends who are may not be Portuguese and they do not understand, you know, they, they say, okay, so how can you describe that? And they always have struggles to describe that word because I feel like there, as you said, there it's, it's a difference between describing it in, to someone who understands the language or is part of your culture to somebody who doesn't. They're like, oh yeah, like you said, it's like being homesick. I'm like, kind of, you know, it's like, oh, it's like missing something. I'm like, oh, a little bit. You know, so it's, it's kind of taking little pieces of all of it, but it's your own cultural feeling of what that means to you. So I resonated with that as you were talking about that. But this, there are just some words that you don't do you don't do it justice if you try to translate it.
speed, 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 speed,
uh, it would be a very foolish thing to do. Uh, if you were to kill me to translate a novel on baseball, I couldn't do it. Okay, it could be easy, but I couldn't do it because beyond, you know, a home run in uh, <laughs> batter in, in the guy who throws the ball, that's about that's about all. You know. So I was at the gym, and this gentleman next to me we were both working on uh, machines, and he tried to establish a, a conversation with me about baseball in America. Yeah, football was a long way. And I, I told him so. so. If you want to talk soccer a little bit, I could probably last, last 15 minutes. But, uh, so we talked about other things. You know. So uh, you have to be very, very sure that you know the subject matter. Okay? Because one thing is you can, you can be a good translator, but if you don't know anything, like, you know, I, I tried to, to address that issue by just talking about billiards, okay? Who am I to translate something about billiards, about pool, if I don't know anything about pool, okay? My, my son loves pool, but I don't know anything about it, so what am I going to say about pool? How am I going to translate those, those, those comments, those, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of, of, of German, you know, that every sport has and so on. So you have to learn the discipline. So never, I would recommend, never try to translate anything with it in just a few pages or a book unless you are absolutely sure. Okay? You cannot ever know everything but that you know that, 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 that subject matter and what you can, what you still do not know, you can, you can learn. You're confident that you can. But if you have to learn baseball and football and, and, and whatever else, and, 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 and uh, you know, if you're going to translate a novel about uh, about the cotton mills, or you, you better know something about cotton mills because if you don't know, if you don't know one turn from the other, or what one person down in, in the cotton mill is doing, the other person who is in the finishing. In the fishing, finishing off the line, uh, you're completely lost. Okay? And then the dictionary is there. When you finish reading the thing, the person who knows that subject matter goes and reads, oh my God, who translated this? Mm -hmm. So you have to be very, 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 very because if someone will know. And you will be found out. <laughs> what well, I think. Uh, one comment that I would like to make, and, and you made reference to, to this, and uh, to some degree, you, you compared, of course, uh, Vittorio Nunes with, uh, with Balthazar Lodge, and, and, and bringing a Soliano that, and in the case of Balthazar Lodge, Capitolini that, and you mentioned the translation that Isabel, uh, Professor Isabella is there on the back, thank you for coming, and uh, and I retranslated the, the novel she came uh, into English. Uh, and, and bringing to Kevin's point is the sharing, you know, of what a translation does, you know, to share the, uh, the, the, the experience uh, to a different world. Uh, in, in the case of she came, what we have uh, found is that the, the people, particularly the Cape Verdean Americans that have read the novel and they provided uh, a survey, a, a read the response uh, to the novel mm -hmm. and how much they learn about their history by reading the translation of the novel mm -hmm. uh, if they never were, uh, you know, brought to that attention, they would never know. So through the sharing of that culture to another language, you bring, you bring that to a bigger audience. But for me personally, uh, and I'm sure for yourself as well, uh, the translation to me was the sharing. It was sharing a son, or a daughter to do. I feel that the translation is much smaller. That's how I feel in bringing that 
uh, I don't know if you, because I, I know of all the books that you have problems with translation, you don't only have one son, you have many. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, when I was translating uh, both uh, those autobiographies that I translated from English to Portuguese and the books that I translated from Portuguese to English, uh, I had to necessarily finish uh, on one hand of uh, the uh, Indians who was in Portugal who may not know our story is in the books. Uh, and that would certainly be one possibility for some people to slow.